How can a person tell if they have the regular seasonal flu or if they've contracted the 2009 H1N1 influenza virus? Well, for a person, him or herself, to be able to determine that would essentially be impossible because you can get everything from very, very mild illness to severe illness with either seasonal flu or the H1N1 new 2009 pandemic flu. Most of the time it's a mild disease, uh, but there are unusual cases that can be severe. The only way a person can tell is if they get their blood drawn or other laboratory tests which could specifically distinguish between one and the other, but that is something that is not done routinely. So if someone wakes up in the morning and feels that they're not uh, well, they get a fever, a muscle ache, some cough, the things that you would get with the flu, it would be very difficult for them to determine whether it's seasonal flu or the H1N1. However, circumstances that are going on in the community can give you a pretty big hint of what you have. Let me give you an example. When H1N1 historically has gone into a community, both in the United States in the spring of 2009, as well as what we're seeing in the Southern Hemisphere, in Argentina, Chile, Australia, in South Africa, it generally overwhelms and crowds out the seasonal flu. So if you're in a community in which we know from surveillance that 99% of the cases of flu are really H1N1, you can make a reasonable assumption that your illness is due to H1N1. If there's a mixture of both or if there's still a lot of seasonal flu in the community, you may not be able to distinguish between one and the other. This year, do I get a shot for the 2009 H1N1 flu in addition to the regular flu shot? Well, you certainly should get your seasonal flu shot, that's for sure. When we talk about the vaccination program for the H1N1, we'd like to be sure that the five priority groups of individuals get the H1N1 that becomes available early on. We fully expect that we would have enough so that you can cover not only the priority groups, but anyone else who feels they want it and need it. So the answer is, yes, you should get the H1N1. If you're not in one of the five priority groups, then you may need to check with your physician or healthcare provider when it would become available to you. Just to be clear, the five priority groups are pregnant women, people who are the caretakers, parents or what have you, of children less than six months old, healthcare workers, young children and young adults from six months to 24 years old, and individuals from 25 to 64 who have underlying medical conditions that would compromise them and put them at a higher risk for complications. What should a person do if they get flu-like symptoms? One of the major concerns is that hospitals will be inundated with the worried well. But at what point should you be concerned enough to seek medical attention? Well, if you have the H1N1 flu or think you have the H1N1 flu or even seasonal flu, let's say if you think you have influenza, most of the time this is a relatively mild illness. It makes you uncomfortable. So what we recommend for people, and this has to do fundamentally with whether or not you should receive treatment with an antiviral drug. So if you have a low-grade fever, some aches, some sniffles, a bit of a cough, and it doesn't go any further than that, you may want to call up your health care provider, explain your symptoms, and I'm sure he or she will tell you that if you start to have difficulty breathing, really uncomfortable, high fevers, really bad myalgias, you should then come in and get a prescription to get treated. Because you want to treat people who have serious disease that either requires hospitalization or may be serious enough to even consider hospitalization. So a phone call or a visit, depending upon how severe it is. Importantly, if you happen to fall into one of the four categories that are at high risk for complications, and that's pregnant women, that is young children, 
that is the elderly individuals older than 65 years old or individuals who have underlying conditions that compromise them. If you fall under one of those four individuals, you shouldn't wait. You should get your physician to get you a prescription to be treated right away. If you're otherwise healthy, you use your judgment. Is it mild enough? Maybe a phone call. You don't necessarily have to go into an emergency room. In fact, we discourage that unless you are feeling really poorly. Are there some basic things that people can do to reduce the likelihood of transmission? Well, there are things that people can do to reduce the likelihood of their getting infected and to reduce the likelihood of their infecting others. And let's talk about reducing the likelihood of your getting infected. First thing, importantly, wash your hands frequently because we know that you can get infected by touching an inanimate object that someone who was infected touched and then touch your nose or your lips or your eyes. Try and stay away as much as possible from rubbing your eyes or your nose or your mouth because that's a very good way to, to transmit the virus. The other thing is to avoid, particularly when there's flu in the community, avoid places where there are people who are sick and coughing and it's a crowded place. Now that's difficult to do. You can't isolate yourself from the rest of the world for the whole flu season, but use some good judgment in that. How you can prevent giving it to others is if you're sick, don't go to school or parents should not send their children to school if they're sick. If you're sick, don't go to work. If you're coughing or sneezing, cover it with a tissue or sneeze or cough into your elbow. Do those kinds of things as well as washing your own hands because you may give it to somebody else from what's on your own hand. NIAID sponsored clinical trials of the 2009 H1N1 influenza vaccine, which began in early August, already have some preliminary results. What are the early data showing us? Well, the early data are, are showing us, we, we did a bunch of trials and the fundamental questions are, is this safe, at least in the short term? Are there any obvious uh, safety issues? Secondly, what is the right dosage to use and how many doses should we give? And what is the sequence of giving it vis-a-vis -vis the seasonal flu vaccine and the H1N1 vaccine? We have some very good news that we got recently that first of all, as we had expected, since this is very much like the seasonal flu vaccine, that there doesn't appear to be any safety red flags or safety issues. The other important issue is that we were able to induce a very powerful response in people, in adults and the elderly, with a single dose of what the classical dosage is, which is 15 micrograms, very typical of what you give with seasonal flu vaccine. That dose not only was effective with a single dose as opposed to two doses, but it also induced a very potent response within eight to 10 days of getting vaccinated, which means when you go get your flu shot, the H1N1, you will induce a response that you could predict would be protective really relatively quickly. Within two weeks, eight to 10 days is what we found. There are some people who are still concerned about a vaccine and possible side effects, but in talking about 2009 H1N1 flu vaccines, you've time and again made a very good point. That is, while there is a risk, a slight risk, associated with the 2009 H1N1 vaccine, there is also a risk if you do nothing and are not vaccinated. Can you elaborate on this? Whenever you make a decision about any intervention that you're gonna allow yourself to undergo, be it a drug or a vaccine, you've gotta balance the risk of what you're gonna do with the benefit that you're gonna get from it. So if you look at the theoretical, but very, very, very small risk of there being anything that's gonna be deleterious with a vaccine, and yet the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic and we're seeing a lot of people getting infected and we're seeing that some of them are getting seriously ill, particularly people in these high risk categories like pregnant women and children and people with underlying conditions, so that the risk of not being protected against influenza balanced against the risk of the vaccine and then the benefit of getting vaccinated versus the benefit of being protected from the uh, uh, influenza that you can get infected. It, it is no doubt that the balance of risk benefit strongly favors the benefit of vaccine because of the risk of influenza versus the relatively small risk of the vaccine.